Thank you, Sarah. A nice Father's Day gift. What a blessing it, it is to celebrate this day, Father's Day. And today we're thinking about another day long before, centuries before, there was a Father's Day holiday. There was a Father's Day celebration. And it happens in that story that Jesus told. But as I'm thinking about the, the power of, of that story to, to transform and to communicate something really important about God and about uh, people and about uh, our relationship with God and with one another, I think about the great reformer Martin Luther. Martin Luther confided to his friends on occasion that his childhood was very difficult. He was raised by parents who were very harsh, even by 15th century standards. If he misbehaved, and misbehaved in, in sort of normal childhood ways, little infractions, they would severely punish him. And so he grew up with this understanding of God as wrathful and vengeful and angry. And, and he was tormented by that understanding of God. He became a monk, trying to be good enough somehow to escape God's wrath and to earn God's love. But Martin Luther, when he learned to read Scripture for himself and opened the pages of the Bible and he saw there this picture of God that was quite different from that, his life was transformed. He saw God as, as loving and accepting and forgiving and welcoming. Well, after Martin Luther married Katie, they built a happy home. Martin Luther, the ex-monk, and Katie, the ex-nun, got married, and they eventually would have six children. And that first child, Hans, was born when Martin was 42 years of age. And there was another transformation for him as he became a father. He would write to a friend that he had no idea how moved a person could be, how tender was the word he used a person could feel toward a baby until he held his own child. Well, Katie and, and Martin created a happy and loving home. He was determined uh, that it would be different for his children. And not only did he experience that power of knowing the depth of love that he experienced as a father, but, but he immediately transferred that to God and, and understood just, he reported, a kind of fraction of what God feels for us, how God views us. It's that image of father that took on new meaning for him. It's that image of father that Jesus used when he talked about uh, God. He addressed God as Abba, the Aramaic word that's probably better translated daddy. It's a very um, intimate term. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a close term. Uh, and that's how Jesus addressed God. And he told this story. It's usually called the parable of the prodigal son, but perhaps it could be better called the parable of the loving father, or even the parable of the prodigal father. You know, you look up the word prodigal, it's someone, someone who's wasteful and extravagant, and that's, that's the kind of love and the grace that the father shows for the son. So there are some movements in this, in this story. We heard the story a moment ago, and we know that it, uh, it, it begins at home. And if you heard the way Mr. Mark said the word home, that's the, that's the feeling of home, right? When we think about home and all that it means at its best, it's that place of acceptance. It's that place of belonging. It's that place that we experience love. That's, that's the best 
understanding of the word home. It's, it's what we yearn for, that kind of home. And the sons have that, both of these sons, the elder son, the younger son. They're at home. But that younger son is wanting something different. There, you know, no home is, is perfect. And, and for whatever reason, he's restless and he wants to go his own way and he wants to, to do things his way. And so he does something that's truly disgraceful. He demands his inheritance when his father is still alive. It, it's tantamount to saying, Dad, why don't you just go ahead and give me what's mine as if you were dead? The father does that, which is also strange and extravagant in an odd kind of way to allow this son to disgrace the family in that way and to go off on his own. And he goes to a far country and he wastes it all and he ends up miserable and broke and yearning for home. He begins to rehearse his speech, as we heard a moment ago. Father, I've sinned against you and before God. I'm not worthy to be called your son. Just take me on as one of your hired servants. He practices. You can imagine he says the speech over and over again, hoping maybe that God would maybe receive him back as a hired servant because he was starving to death and miserable. And he makes his way home. Have, have you yearned for the far country? Or have you found yourself in the far country? Have, have you wanted to go your own way and found out that that was not working very well? Maybe you, you want a, a different job or you want to move to a different place or you want to do something different because you have problems and it's, the grass is greener on the other side and maybe, maybe I can leave behind whatever's going on with me. Have you had that experience? Socrates uh, once had a conversation with someone who, who uh, pointed to a man who was prominent and wealthy, and he traveled all the time. He saw more of the world than anyone uh, back then could have seen, and, and yet he was unhappy. And so they asked Socrates the question, with all that he has, with all of his travels, with all that he has seen, why is he unhappy? And Socrates' answer was, well, wherever he goes, he takes himself with him. You know, someone has said, wherever I go, there I am again. There is that sense of trying to get away from something that's going on with us, but it goes with us. And that's the case, apparently, with the younger son. He's still not happy. He's still miserable. And so he, he makes his way home. And the father acts in a way that, well, it, it, it would have shocked Jesus' hearers. It's, it's disgraceful, frankly, the way the father behaves. See, the way he should have behaved, what social convention would say is he should have made the son beg and perhaps wear sackcloth and ashes and have a period of, well, a period of uh, penitence and then maybe, maybe he would receive him back in some capacity. In, in fact, he should have behaved as though the son were dead to him because the son had behaved as though the father were dead to him. That's not what happens at all. The son is, 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 is trudging home and he's, he's, uh, he's rehearsing that speech, but he doesn't even get the words out of his mouth. The father runs to greet him, and that's disgraceful. A man of his social standing, a man of his wealth and his importance would never run. He might tell servants to run, but he himself would never run. It would be undignified. It would be disgraceful. And, but, he, but he can't help himself. He runs to meet his son before his son even makes it all the way home and he embraces him and he kisses him and he gives him a robe and a ring and shoes for his feet, kills the fattened calf and they have a big celebration. 
That's the nature. That's the nature of the, of the father. He's a prodigal. He's extravagant. He's wasteful in his love, in his grace, in his acceptance. And what Jesus is saying is that's what God is like. There is another character in this story. When we ask those questions that help us find our place in this story at any given time in our lives, what does this say about me? What does this say about my relationship with others? And What does this say about God and my relationship with, with God? We have to take into consideration that elder brother. The elder brother was always faithful. He never left home. And, and yet... When he hears that there's a party going on and he finds out that his brother has returned and is being welcomed in this way, he is furious and resentful. And if you note, what he says to his father is, um, you never as much as killed a goat that I could have a party with my friends. But listen to his words, this son of yours, doesn't call him his brother, this son of yours who has gone and wasted everything, comes home and you welcome him with a feast. And he refuses to go in and join the party. The father's response is, but but son, I know you've always been with me. But this brother of yours, he reminds him of that really important relationship. This brother of yours, was dead and now he's alive he was lost and now he's found and and we have to that's the that's the word we have to have this celebration so sometimes we can be the elder brother there there may be people that we think don't deserve the prodigal wasteful, extravagant love of God. Jesus told that parable in response to very religious people who were grumbling, it says, because he was eating and drinking with tax collectors and sinners, the wrong sort of people. And he told this parable in response to that. Now, the fascinating thing about these two brothers, is they had something in common, as different as they were. And what they had in common is each one misjudged the father. Each one did. The younger son fully expected to, well, probably be rejected, but maybe be accepted, but not really as a son anymore. The older brother knew for sure how the father would act toward that wandering, wasteful son. And they were both wrong. The amazing grace, love of that father, whose celebration that day was a Father's Day celebration for him. He had to celebrate because his son had returned home. And Jesus said, God is like that. So today on this day, I, I want you to hear the good news that no matter where you are in your life, no matter where you've been, no matter how far you feel that you have gone from God, that uh, God waits with open arms, in fact, to, to run with extravagant love and grace to welcome you home. And that's the good news of our faith on this day. Amen.